Hello and welcome to this presentation about autism and suicide. Uh, my name is Christine. I'm the Senior Autism Advisor at Barnet Minka at the Autism Service. And my name is Emma Cooper and I'm an Autism Advisor at Barnet Minka Autism Service as well. Right. The um, goal of this session is to raise awareness about um, high functioning autism, what is high functioning autism, and uh, the higher risk that people on the spectrum have of dying by suicide. So the goals are uh, we want people to have a better understanding of autism and high functioning autism. We would like people to have a better understanding of the specific difficulties uh, people with high functioning autism face. We would like people to be aware of the impact these difficulties have on the lives of people with autism and the impact on the risk of death by suicide. And also we would like people to be aware of some basic strategies to help a person with high functioning autism to cope with the condition. So we are going to begin with some common views on autism. Um, many people have heard about autism. Many people have some um, basic knowledge about what autism is, but still autism is a very wide concept. There are different ways of being autistic. So for some people, this is the representation of autism. Um, Rain Man, as portrayed in, in the movie Rain Man, uh, that could be autism for some people. Then some other people um, think that autism is more related to another um, character, Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory. Some people think that autism is always linked to uh, being a genius, being academically very brilliant and, um, and being able to have a very successful life in academia, for example. But we know that uh, autism has other aspects that some people might be familiar with. Um, for example, um, we see that in these pictures, all these people are quite gifted and have savants and superpowers, which Christine has already talked on. And we'll talk later about autism is an invisible disability. Uh, not everybody, you don't have to have a savant, a superpower to have autism. It's a very wide spectrum. And uh, there isn't anything about being mildly autistic or severely autistic. That doesn't depend on whether you can speak or have a specialist power, et cetera. So we want to show you that it's a very varied spectrum. And even some of your common views, we would like you to challenge every time you have someone with uh, a social and communication difference sitting in front of you. And we know that autism looks like this as well. Um, women, female, have generally been uh, uh, been falling through the net of the system. They haven't been uh, identified with autism as often as men. If they do, they are identified usually uh, when they are older, usually when they take the first step to, uh, to search for a diagnosis, because sometimes a family member, a child is going through that process, and that's when they identified with autism as well. And so this is a combination of uh, many years ago when autism was first identified, it was only seen as a condition that could be seen in men. And therefore, the tools that were originally created only identified men. And even today, there are very few diagnostic tools for high functioning women. So as Christine has already said, it's more down to women going through many different diagnoses, uh, some correct, some incorrect and then self-identifying with the characters of autism, uh, possibly through another family member or when they search for answers for their own children. But it's still um, statistically identified far less in women and they have far greater challenges um, than it is in men. And that's partly because of the generic makeup of women, that women are more sociable, uh, women or have more empathy, whether it be in the autistic community or in um, neurotypicals, and that can mask it to people looking at them, even highly qualified professionals and specialists in the field. Exactly. And these uh, women that we have 
chosen as examples here, they can be highly successful in their own specific field, but they face difficulties in other aspects of their lives. So uh, that shows how difficult it can be for someone to just judge someone with autism just by looking at them or just by looking at a, a written CV, for example. Nobody wakes up one morning and thinks, I think I'll be autistic today, or well, that's a good career choice for me. So if you have a high functioning adult who appears articulate, but is struggling with life and is sitting in front of you and raises to you that they feel they may be on the spectrum or raises behaviors to you that you see in line with the social and communication uh, difference, I would say be very open to help them explore that. Mm -hmm. So we would like to, to begin with, we would like to explain a little bit more about autism and what is the difference with high functioning autism, which is uh, what we will, will be talking about today. So the official uh, diagnosis, the official term is autistic spectrum disorder, or sometimes you will see autistic spectrum condition. That's usually what you would say, what you would see on your um, NHS statement if you go for a diagnosis, that is the, the term. Um, what differentiates autism from high functioning autism is if the person has an additional learning disability. That means if the person has some cognitive impairment. So there can be people with autism that also have a learning disability. Sometimes you will hear that as called as classic autism or low functioning autism, but it's just simply autism. So any of those terms mean the same thing. If the person doesn't have a learning disability, so if there, there is no cognitive impairment, if their IQ is average or above average, then we are talking about high functioning autism. Um, some people use another term, which is Asperger or ASPI. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, sorry, go on. Many people with high functioning autism will have a learning difference. And this is where the confusion often comes in. So some may have been to mainstream school, some may have been to special school. But as Christine has said, it's actually about their IQ. Is it below 70? Mm -hmm. um, so learning difference doesn't mean that they, that they have a learning disability. But everyone with autism learns differently because their brain is wired differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, what people with autism may have as well is a learning difficulty. And a learning difficulty is that they have difficulties to learn. Usually it's because they have uh, another condition associated. It could be dyslexia, it could be dyspraxia, dyscalculia, it could be ADHD. So as Emma was saying, they learn differently because their brain is wired differently. And even in people who don't have a specific learning difficulty like dyslexia, dyspraxia, et cetera, will learn differently. We see many people who leave school with no qualifications and end up in future life do it, getting a PhD. And this is because a lot of our, the information that people on the spectrum learn because they learn differently, it's self-taught. They're also much better at learning uh, by doing it their own way and finding their own means to the ends. So someone can appear that they have a learning disability by talking slowly. That might be, or all sorts of other things, that might merely be just that they have delayed processing or their cognitive process works differently. So don't assume from what is coming out of the mouth, that that's a true representation of the person that you know. Mm -hmm. And those, that person presenting differently from other people around you by the way they talk, the way they learn, the way they behave, that has to do with what is autism at the core, which is a, um, a communication and social and communication difficulty. And that is linked to the triad of impairment. So if you and I want to, Explain. It's going to give some examples of difficulty with social communication. So it would be things like uh, not being able to speak or being selectively mute. But equally, you can be highly articulate at times and still selective mute or highly articulate and not selective mute at all. 
highly articulate verbally and unable to translate that into words or actions. Uh, you might have echolalia or repetition of words or phrases. You might become fixated on things um, and have OCD type behaviours, um, either that might manifest themselves cognitively or actually in fixations and day-to-day -day routines. These may be a standalone conditions or not. You might not want to interact uh, or struggle when interacting and initiating conversations, particularly if it's small talk. So you prefer your conversations to focus on your specialist interests um, or specifically about topics you know. Um, examples of difficulty with so social interaction might be things, oh, sorry, I forgot to say also things like using appropriate language, body language, facial expression, tone of voice. Those obviously all come under examples of difficulty with social communication. Uh, difficulties with social interaction, to name a few, might be difficulty reading other people, recognizing their feelings. Um, recognizing their intentions, uh, particularly based on the context, not being able to transfer skills from one scenario to another, uh, social anxiety as a standalone condition or, or as part of um, ASD, and understanding the unwritten social rules. Um, also, somebody who spends a lot of time studying psychology and trying to find out like a blueprint for the social rules. Um, and you may find it not necessarily difficult to make the friendships, but it's more about how you maintain friendships. Um, and that can be a real difficulty pe for people. Um, just to say kind of a bit more general, some autistic individuals have strong preference for routine. And sometimes uh, this would be due to unpredictability of the world around them. Um, some may find, I would say most would find, new and unfamiliar and uncertain situations and experiences very stressful. And this is because it can feel really threatening and put one into a kind of fight or flight mode. So it's like living as if you're going for the world's most important interview most days of your life, which is great if you're going for an interview. But if it's just day to day living, that can have an enormous impact on people's uh, stress levels and their mental and physical health. Um, some individuals, as we talked before, have special interests, um, which can actually be important to their well-being, as can having a, a, a savant or stimming. Uh, in the past, many parents were told to disencourage um, their children with these things, but we actually know now there's evidence that this uh, supports one's well-being to let you be able to do this. Let me uh, just mention that um, stimming is short for self-stimulation behavior. So it's usually when you see someone, it's very common to see it in children with autism when you see them flapping their arms, maybe rocking, uh, running around, things like that. And adults have way to do stimming behaviors which are more subtle and more socially appropriate, but they all follow, the, uh, they all have the same uh, goal, which is reducing the anxiety and the stress of that person and help them coping with the situation. Thank you, Christine. See, I'm presuming everyone speaks the same language, which is my difference. Um, many autistic people also experience, or I would say, if not all, the sensory world differently. Um, so that can cause distress. It can sometimes cause pleasure, you know, if you see in great detail or, or like in the picture earlier, Stephen Wiltshire, the artist, um, that was due to the fact that he has great attention to detail and hyper focuses and sees the world in a different way. But the impact of living um, in a world where you have no control over your sensory environment, that is your sight, sound, smell, touch, taste, um, can really, really impact very quickly on an individual and um, cause that lead, lead to meltdown and burnout very quickly. So those are the elements of what uh, the triad of impairment, which is what many people um, use to describe autism, social 
difficulties, communication difficulties, rigid thinking difficulties with change. And um, there is a fourth element to this triad, which is sensory issues. And those four elements are also the um, diagnostic criteria for autism, both for high functioning autism and regular autism. Remember, autism is the same. What changes is whether the person has a learning disability or not at the same time. So the people that we see, the people that have um, high functioning autism usually would come across as maybe being very intelligent, but having those difficulties to socialize, to do the right thing. They are always the odd one out. They can come across as rude, saying inappropriate things and being uh, struggling to uh, cope with change and with uh, things have to be their own way. They're often seen as people who have difficulties at work despite their intelligence. So at an interview, they perform really well, but maybe because of their social difficulties and being part of a team and inability to be flexible, to be flexible um, in the workplace, you very often need to be a team player. So that causes problems. They also may be your clients who often appear to complain a lot and it's not that they're difficult it's just that if you have inflexible thoughts then uh, when someone says something you believe that what they said is correct and that they're going to stick by it and it's very difficult for you to change from that particularly if you're going purely on the spoken word that comes out of their mouth and you're not able to read uh, the other 93 percent of of communication, which is through body language, tone of voice, sarcasm, nuances, etc. Mm -hmm. So um, we know that um, the prevalence of autism in the UK population is uh, around one percent, and that means that means that there is around seven hundred thousand people in the UK with autism. But this, be aware that these are the people that have been identified and have a diagnosis. In our service, we carry out screenings. Uh, with to adults that suspect they have autism. So all the clients we see, they are not part of the statistic because they haven't been diagnosed in the past. So there might be people out there that are autistic and they are not aware of it and people around them are not aware of it. And also the diagnostic criteria and the need for screening and the way we um, the way we capture our stats and things like that varies across the world. But, you know, autism is not, uh, it doesn't go, it goes across class, it goes across culture, it goes across everything. It's prevalent in every area, in every society, in everywhere in the world. So absolutely, we know that those statistics, however well done, unfortunately, are just the uh, tip of the iceberg. Mm. And regarding women on the spectrum, the situation is, is even worse. So uh, there are no clear studies um, and the figures can change with, uh, depending on what papers you're reading. So uh, some studies say that there is one female for every 15 men on the spectrum, or the studies say that it's one woman for every four male. Um, I think the figure is now between uh, around one woman for every three men. But why are these figures uh, so, so different? And, there could be many reasons. Maybe it's because uh, actually men have more autism than women. Maybe it's because we um, are not using the right tools to identify women. Maybe because women don't get referred to an autism screening or an autism diagnosis assessment as much as men do. Um, so there might be lots of reasons influencing that, but we know that more and more women are being identified now and women tend to be identified later than men. So a man could be identified as being autistic, maybe in school, uh, maybe because his behaviors are more uh, dis uh, disruptive in class, and then that child would be picked up. While a girl on the spectrum can present sometimes as being very shy, very quiet. She might enjoy be, uh, reading on her own, not getting into trouble. And maybe teachers would fail to identify that as maybe uh, uh, being on the spectrum. Uh, but we know it is part of being autistic, especially in women. And these women just go through the system without getting the support. And it's later in life uh, after 
sometimes several other diagnoses that have been put in place that they discover autism and they start identifying behaviors that they do that match the definition of autism. This, so, this can be at an enormous cost to the individual though, and that is particularly relevant to the uh, subject matter that we are discussing today, because you will go on to see how uh, in women on the spectrum, suicide is very common because uh, autism is very often left till the last diagnosis. And that's not because people are deliberately doing this. It's just it doesn't come on the radar. Uh, if they're lucky for some women, it comes on the radar after they've attempted on their lives for many times. Uh, but unfortunately, we still lose people. Um, through taking their own life, through undiagnosed high-functioning autism. It's a real thing that's happening every day, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And the relevance of uh, what we're explaining, that many people are still undiagnosed and the, the pressure and that having this condition puts on people's and people's mental health is very relevant because we know that um, having a... a dual diagnosis or having other conditions as well as autism is very common. So according to MIND, the mental health charity, up to 70% of people with autism have another condition, um, mostly anxiety and depression, but there are many other conditions that they can also have. Um, some very common are personality disorders, eating disorders, um, OCD, bipolar uh, disorder, so and many other. So a person with autism has a greater uh, probability of having more mental health problems associated. And if we think that they might have been gone through 20, 30, 40, 50 years of their life without receiving, being identified as autistic and therefore receiving the right support, that puts a lot of pressure on their mental health. Um, we also know that um, at least 40% uh, of people on the spectrum have a dual diagnosis uh, with autism and ADHD. So again, if someone has ADHD, it's quite likely that they might have autism. So it's worth referring them for a screening, for example, and, and the other way around. If they have autism, there is also a high, pr high probability that they might have ADHD. So often they go hand in hand. And again, we know that the statistic is... is uh under under reported um, because the nature of the conditions ADHD at, uh, you're very chaotic and struggle to get your paperwork and your thoughts in order and AD, uh, autism is a social and communication difference and you can be very rigid and the two conditions kind of uh, sabotage each other so it's quite hard for people to express to clinicians what's going on. Um, and sometimes they're even scared to express it because they kind of feel like they're going slightly crazy for warrant of another word, because the two conditions, it's like having Jackal and Hyde on opposite shoulders. Mm -hmm. So, for example, some of the common issues with ADHD is many people identify the hyperactivity, but other elements very common in ADHD are the, the problems with attention, concentration, um, procrastination, the ability to plan ahead, etc. So if you think of someone that has high functioning autism, so they might be very um, academically gifted and very good at school, but they are always procrastinating, they are unable to, to concentrate, they are not able to plan how they are going to study, how are they, they are going to, to write a, a, a paper or anything like that, then they might fail in school and that might be very frustrating for them or they might be able to make it through school but then they are not able to make it in the, in the work environment. So, and for women specifically with ADHD, again, it's, it's under or ADD, it's under identified in women, although we're further down that line with identification possibly than females on the spectrum. But for females with, with ADD or ADHD, very often they're described as having um, hyperactivity of the mouth. So they talk and talk and talk and talk. Now that really contradicts what we think of people with autism. 
so that can be a real um, red herring to people mm. and they may not think uh, ADHD and autism, they may think this person has multiple personalities and they may have that as well as the two conditions. And just to make everything more complicated, autism is an invisible condition, which means that you cannot see if a person is autistic just by looking at their face. You might realize that someone is different, that they might be a bit quirky, uh, that there is something strange about them, but it's not something that you can just identify by looking at a picture. So it's very easy to say, oh, you look normal, you don't have autism. And you have a family, you can't have autism. You're far too nice, I've heard uh, someone was told recently by a medical profession. You're far too nice a person to have autism. What on earth does that mean? And so I guess we're not criticising anybody, but what we're saying is every day of your life you will walk past the street, down the street, or have people sitting in front of you who you have absolutely no idea. It's not the people who are flapping or the people with the ear defenders that you might see who are possibly more visible as being quirky. It's the people that you can't quite pinpoint or they've gone through all the generic services and still they're having the same difficulties and the tools that you're trying to apply just aren't working that maybe you need to be looking a bit deeper mm -hmm. or referring on to specialist services. And this is a misconception that not only professionals have, um, also your family members might struggle. They might think there is nothing wrong with you, you because they cannot see anything wrong, physically wrong with you. So family members also struggle to sometimes accept your diagnosis of autism if it comes uh, at, uh, when you're an adult. And again, this can impact further on people's mental health because after years and years, they, they think the individual thinks they finally found the answer. And for some people, they will really embrace it and they want to share it. It's like they're out and proud and they want to tell everybody. Mm -hmm. And if that you get a stony wall from your family and they really don't accept it, then you feel, finally, I found myself. But where, where does that leave me if my family don't accept? it so that can really impact again it's like a double whammy um, of finding out who you are but being misbelieved by your nearest and dearest and for these are some real quotes that we've heard from our clients so throughout their life they've been told these things and many others um, because people identify that they are different that they might be difficult to deal with but no one had an answer. So people were putting these labels onto them. So again, think of the impact on their mental health. If all your life you've been called childish, selfish, unreliable, difficult, difficult or rude or blunt, um, people might have called you an attention seeker, a drama queen. People might judge you and say that you're not trying hard enough. But also you have to remember that this is through the eyes of the neurotypical world, these labels. Now, if you take into consideration that the word autism comes from the Greek word auto, which means from the self outwards. So if you see the world from the self outwards and through your experiences, you can understand where possibly uh, someone might appear selfish to a parent or a loved one. You know, if you're a partner of someone who's high functioning on the spectrum and everything is from your perspective and your way, because that is the way you do it, I can imagine maybe that appears that you're deliberately doing it and you're being selfish rather than you don't know any other way to do it. A very common one. It's always your way or no way. Yeah, and, and people have been called worse things than that and by professionals and by family members, free, uh, friends, um, peers. So again, think of the impact on their mental health. And that brings us to um, autism and the risk of um, suicide. So there is a, a report uh, by Autistica, which is available online. It's called Personal Tragedies, Public Crisis, and it's full of uh, useful information and shocking information. Um, we, it says in that report that adults with autism are more likely to die by suicide than the general population. Um, uh, it says that people with autism die over 16 years earlier than people without autism. 
So that is a very shocking figure. So it's 16 years of your life shorter. And why, why, why is the reason? Why do people die earlier if they are so intelligent, if they can access potentially all the services available to them? So there must be something stopping them from getting the right support, from being in a right place in their mind and in their life. That and also we them. started to come back a full circle at the beginning of this of me saying, if you live every life, every day of your life, before you're even verbal, in a heightened state of anxiety, as if you're going to the world's most important interview, that must impact on your stress levels and your immune system and your mental and physical health. So that all feeds into this statistic that Christine is talking about. And we really do have to take on board. It is a public crisis. The individual might be struggling with it, but we all have a responsibility mm -hmm. because these people, uh, th this, this portion of society, given the right support and the right diagnosis, would be able to give so much back to society, uh, both work-wise and, and, and take pressure off the services long-term. Mm -hmm. so, would... so, so the system is really failing these people by not identifying and by not providing the right support. And the figure, um, just so you know, the figure for people with autism and a learning disability is even more shocking. So they die over 30 years before people who are not autistic. So as Emma said, this is definitely a public crisis. And we are not criticizing the system. What we were doing is saying, you know, we have learned a lot more as time changes. Now we, with this information and this statistic and this report from Autistica, we really need to be changing the uh, landscape of the next generation. We really can't be having these conversations, um, you know, when none of us are still longer walking on this planet. I hope there's no need for these sort of things. So another figure which is very relevant is that uh, uh, autistic adults make up between seven and 15% of the suicidal population. What does that mean? It means that out of all the people that die by suicide, between seven and 15% have autism. Now, remember what we said at the beginning, within the UK population, the prevalence of autism is 1%. So in the population of people that have died by suicide, that raises from 1% to something between 7 and 15. So it's a massive increase and there must be a reason for this. So again, think of the impact on mental health, think of the difficulties identifying people on the spectrum and offering the right support. So all that could be tackled to prevent death by suicide because suicide is a preventable death. And by offering the wrong support, Again, it's not a criticism, but that impacts on the mental health, which feeds into, you know, you're already struggling and then you try to access services and the services, for whatever reason, can't hear you or speak a different language to you. And then that impacts on the very reason why you went to them in the first place, be it the depression or the suicidal thoughts or the mental health or the isolation or whatever it is. Uh, so we come on later to kind of some things you can do and, and strategies that are not foolproof, but maybe just get people thinking and can help change this slightly. And we finally, we know that after heart disease, suicide is now the leading cause of early death in adults with autism and no learning disabilities. So that is nine times more likely than the general population to die by suicide. So what can, can be done to support people on the spectrum? What can be done to make these uh, figures go down to prevent death by suicide? I mean, we don't have, no one has an answer, but there are things that can be done that can help. So um, probably people on the spectrum are less likely to use some services as, um, for example, helplines, because remember, uh, autism is a social and communication uh, con difficult um, condition 
So when we're developing things like helplines and crisis lines, we need to think that it it shouldn't only be able to be accessed by through verbal communication or by the person directly. So, you know, to that effect, the pandemic has really helped us because we all use now Zoom. We realize texting, email, uh, maybe being more specific about time slots and appointment things. Um, although there are still some some crisis services who do not have the facility to be able to text clients or text clients in advance to say this is when you have a withheld number at three o'clock, it's me calling you. Because if we can't provide that sort of service, we're automatically stopping these clients accessing those services and that's not out of them being awkward they actually can't like a blind person is never going to be able to see yes services mental health services especially cannot be one size fits all because we know people with autism will need reasonable accommodations um, and that is uh, what the law says so services need to make these reasonable accommodations in order to provide the right service to this um, to this population um, there are, for example, we are getting there little by little because there are um, apps. Um, if you are thinking about suicide, people can reach out through apps. They can uh, receive support via text messages. So there are services out there that offer a wider uh, uh, chance to a wider service to, to people. And also, please always feel free to contact us because Not that we have all the answers, but there are specific apps which are specifically better for neurodiverse individuals. So not necessarily um, for suicide, but even things like for self-harm and stuff like that, which again, and and for eating disorders, again, is very, very common Mm -hmm. for individuals who are diverse. Yeah, um, th- all these difficulties, they also are related to the fact that we know that um, one in every five people on the spectrum also have alexithymia. And alexithymia is the difficulty identifying and understanding and describing emotions. So if you are going through a difficult period in your life and you are thinking about suicide, how are you going to seek help? How are you going to tell someone that you need help and support? Or how are you going to identify that you are actually so close to to making such a radical decision? So it's a struggle to understand your own feelings, your own feelings, but also someone else's feelings. And if a person with autism and a neurotypical person, so someone without autism, are having a conversation, there might be a barrier there. So someone has to break through that barrier and make the effort to accommodate. And it wouldn't be that the individual is necessarily lying or trying to master you. It might be about the use of the language. You know, if they ask someone, how are you feeling okay?" when they're sitting in front of you or they're on the line to you, they might be feeling okay. Do you have a plan? No, I don't have a plan. Um, What are the things that that stop you taking your own life? Oh, I love my pets. They're answering your questions. That is not necessarily a reflection of what they're going to do when they walk out of your office or they put the phone down, unfortunately. And it's not that they're lying or trying to hide hide anything. It's about the language that is used. And unfortunately, at the moment, we don't have a foolproof set of tools that you can ask the clients who are on the spectrum. But it's just being aware that, you know, 7% of communication is the spoken word, but someone on the autistic spectrum will read it 100% through the words that come out of your mouth. And remember that uh, one of the key elements of autism is that rigidity of thinking, so, and people having also very literal language. So if, for example, you suspect suspect that someone might be thinking about um, suicide and you ask them, oh, are you thinking about uh, hurting yourself? The person might say no, because in their mind, their plan might be taking pills and make it painless. So they are replying to your question. They are, they are telling you the truth, but you are, not, uh, you are not reaching the core of what is going on within that person's life. And as we've already said, you know, 70% have a, have a dual diagnosis. That's the figures from mine. Then we, so there's all sorts of things to, 
put into the equation. And then if we look at the 40%, which we know is underestimated of people having a dual diagnosis of ADHD, someone with ADHD is very impulsive. They're not going to want to sit and have this conversation. So for many people, we hear this in, in with police custody and stuff like this. Uh, someone with ADHD just wants to get out of there. So they'll just say what they need to say to you at that moment so that they can end this conversation. So obviously that you need to be aware of too. Um, and all these things impact that it gives you a very uh, sketchy picture to work with of what actually is going on. So without uh, a blueprint of what is the right thing to do, the person, the basic strategy that we could recommend is that the person needs to know oneself so they can communicate with others. It's important to disclose your difficulties, whether you have a label or not, whether you have a diagnosis in place or not. Disclose your difficulties to professionals that are, that are supporting you so that they can adapt and offer you a more tailored service. There are also things in place like a hospital passport, autism awareness card, a police autism awareness card, things um, that are quite standard where you can write what you struggle with and uh, what things work for you. For example, if I am going to the hospital and I am uh, in a, not in a very good shape, so I don't want to be waiting in the waiting room because it's very noisy, it's full of smell, it's, and it's very stressful. So as a person with autism, you could request is there anywhere else that I can wait that is quiet where I can dim the lights and so on? Well, you have to remember that for many people, as we said, autism is from the south outwards. You only know what you know. So for many people, they don't know that they experience the world sensorially different to other people. So they wouldn't be able to identify that they needed a quiet room or that they were overwhelmed or that you know, they just might become rude and aggressive. And if you become rude and aggressive, the normal standardized thing is to evacuate that person from that, from that place, because obviously you have a duty to the other people in it as well. So for many people on the spectrum, certainly pre-diagnosis, uh, what do I need? I don't know what I need, the individual said. They really don't. Mm -hmm. So being proactive is, something that uh, anyone on the spectrum should do. They should become experts on their own condition so they can communicate that to others. And then the people around them can also adapt and learn how to communicate with them. Um, a good idea would be to create a written plan for your loved ones or for anyone working with you. So, because if you are struggling, you might not be very struggling with your mental health, for example, you are very stressed, very anxious, you might not be at your best, in the best position to communicate your issues. But if you write them down when you are in a different place in your life, when you're feeling better, then you are giving that information to your loved one, people around you, and they can be prepared and they will be able to support you a bit better when you are oh. struggling. And to your, to your bosses at work, we have several women who have shared at the women's group who are working and highly articulate and have families. And, but when they're in a bad place, they're selective mute. And that will shock many people. So it's for them, because they know that they're diverse and they know that they're different. With that, they're able to better know themselves and to give their family or their work colleagues some sort of plan but if you haven't had the the difference identified then you don't have the opportunity to do those things so to summarize if you think that you or someone you know or someone you work with might be autistic because they have uh, difficulties with communication with social interaction uh, they don't uh, don't feel comfortable with change. They have a very rigid way of being in the world. They have sensory issues. They might be on the spectrum. You can um, refer them to us or they can self-refer to us and we will do a screening, which is the first step on the NHS pathway for adults in Barnet to receive eventually a formal diagnosis of autism. So first they come to us and then they go to hospital for a formal assessment. Um, and that will give the person more information about their difficulties and their struggles, why, uh, why they are the way they are. 
and also anyone around them should be then aware of this higher risk of death by suicide and the red flags uh, for, uh, that are around this person if they are struggling with their mental health. We say that no, no screening is a wasted screening. If somebody has a negative screening, that's absolutely fine with us because if you're seeing them sitting in front of you and you're concerned about the mental health and the possibilities of suicide, um, then we want to be able to rule out autism as much as we want to be able to confirm that they, that they probably have it. So we would always rather you send them to us. It's not an issue at all. Uh, if you have concerns about how you could uh, address this with the person that's sitting in front of you. If you think they're going to be shocked when you suggest autism, please give us a phone call and we'll be happy to discuss with you mm -hmm. how it might be more palatable for you to raise the subject. Um, as we said, let's just get those conversations changing. And, and if we can do one tiny thing, all of us, to try and change the statistics, um, then today's presentation has been 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 worth it and we hope you've gained something from it exactly and you know now where we are you have our email and telephone number so please feel free to contact us as emma said for a referral or just to talk about a specific client someone you have in mind we'll be more than happy to have that conversation with you so thank you very much for your time and hopefully we will uh, hear from you soon thank you bye bye, bye.